You're listening to the Staffa Corner Podcast, a Staffatarian look at entertainment and life with your host, Greg Staffa. My guest for this episode is a well-known actress, Alicia Coppola. I've seen her in shows like NYPD Blue, Ally McBeal, NCIS, CSI, Sons of Anarchy, Shameless, and the list goes on and on. I'm excited to have her today. Alicia, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And please let me know if you have problems hearing me at all. For some reason, I've been cutting out a little bit here and there. Oh, you sound great. It's probably a little bit warmer where you are. It's negative 8 degrees right now in Minnesota. Where about in Minnesota are you? Central Minnesota, uh, just outside a town called St. Cloud. Oh, well, that sounds nice, though. It sounds cozy. Uh, it is when you're indoors. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and looking outside, it looks beautiful. But, yeah, heading outside is cold. So you're one of those actresses. When I mentioned to you to about five different people, they're like, I don't know who that is. And then you show them a picture of you, and they're like, oh, I love her. Do you still have some kind of amenity to, to your daily life? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I've, I've pretty much uh, flown under the radar um, for the majority of my career. I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of holding out to fly above the radar, which um, I do believe is in the cards. But, the, um, but nonetheless, I've been really, really fortunate in my career to, to kind of be that, that actress who – you may not know my name, but you know my work because I change for every character that I do. So I'm really proud of that. I, I take roles specifically for that reason so that I can lose Alicia and just become that, that character. So whether or not you know my name, you absolutely know my work. And that's actually more important to me. Really? And that was one of the yeah. things that surprised me because a lot of these actors and actresses, you know, Henry Winkler does a show now. And he's still Henry Winker, the, the Fonz. You know, there's, yep. there's so many things that we, we kind of associate with an actor and we kind of link them to. And you still have some stuff that you're linked to, but not as heavily as one might assume, given your, your resume, which is just outstanding. I mean, there's just so many shows where you're like, I, I can't peg her. Oh, yeah, she's been on. And the more, I mean, you've had an extensive career that is amazing to me. And that's one of the reasons I was so excited to get you on because – you do seem like one of those that fly under the radar, and I was always curious if that was something deliberate or if that was something that was, you know, your own design. Given that you are, you know, a mother, you are a family woman, you are, you do have the kids and stuff like that. So, what got you into acting? Well, first, I want to just piggyback on what you just said. I don't think it was a choice that I made. I did make a choices early on, like I passed on Lost because I didn't want to uh, move my family to Hawaii. OK, oh, in wow. retrospect, not a really smart move, not a smart career move. But I've always taken jobs with the hope that it, something would spike. And, and I've been lucky. A few things have. And, you know, and that's really what it is to be an artist. Like you hope something lands. And when it lands, you hope that it ignites something. And then when it ignites something, you hope that the spark turns into a fire. Right. Sure. So what made me become an actress? I was at NYU. And I was in, in an apartment and I needed to move. And I found another apartment and the woman that I rented from was a model. And she introduced me to her agency. And that agency sent me out for a game show on MTV called Remote Control. And I got it. And that was with Colin Quinn and Ken Ober and mm -hmm. Mario Joyner and Adam Sandler and Colin Quinn. And for, at that moment, I kind of realized um, as a 19 year old girl, wow, this makes me happy. There's something about this that I feel fulfilled because all throughout my childhood and, and teenage years when I was in boarding school, I played the clarinet, I played the flute, I played the, you know, I, I wrote poetry, I danced, I, but I never really fully found the art that allowed me to use all of me. And I mean, not that doing remote control and MTV was, you know, Shakespearean, but I found it to be really quite liberating and I found myself being all in. So it was then that I decided, huh, this, this could be something. So, so it was then. So it opened a window of an opportunity that you saw that you could grasp onto and, and continue to do what you love doing. Correct. Um, I was on set 
and my cousin, who is a movie producer, a very prolific producer, she introduced me to her agent at the time, uh, who was an agent at William Morris, and he signed me immediately. And it was pretty much that that meeting that cemented what I think my future was going to be. Oh, wow. So you never really had that struggling, because you've been, I mean, ever since then, you've been having pretty good, consistent roles, at least guest roles and stuff like that, where you haven't had that struggling actress thing that most people associate with acting? When I was 45. When, you were 45. when I turned 45, when my daughter was, I guess, three, that's when the struggle happened. Really? Yeah. When I, because at that point, you know, if you live past 40 in Hollywood, you know, you got some nerve on you, you know, as a woman, it's like you should have been dead already. Um, so at that, you know, your mid forties, people don't really know what to do with you. And cause you're not an ingenue, although I was really never an ingenue. I was kind of always been like an, like an old dame in the body of a, you know, in a, in the body of a young woman. Mm -hmm. But at 45 was when I began to struggle and it was hard. It was hard. I don't think I worked for a good two years, maybe two or three years. It was hard. Yeah, it was very hard. Did you think about giving up or was this something that you just had to plow through? Oh, like every day, every day I thought about giving up every day. I thought, you know, what am I doing? Why, why am I, this is Sisyphusian, you know, I'm like banging my head against a wall, but at the same time, I'm not a quitter. And I knew that it would pass. And when you enjoy, I mean, your own story, if you enjoy the highs, you know that the lows are going to come. Sure. You know, a career is, you know, you have, you have the valley and, and, you have, and you have the hills. And a rose doesn't bloom year long. No. So I just kind of knew that that was going to be my, 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 what's the word, fallow years. It just, you know, and I, I learned from them. And they made me actually not only a better person, but I think they made me a richer actor. A, I had, you know, three kids. Um, every year that goes on in my marriage is another year that I'm really, really proud of. Um, every year my children grow, there's more that I learn. And there's just more, there's more fabric to the tapestry that I am that I just bring to my work. That's a great philosophy to have. And I think more people, not just in acting, but just in general need to have with life and how you approach the ups and downs and focus on the family and stuff like that. So you started doing these roles and you seem to have a history of doing more guest appearances. And every few years you get something that kind of sticks a little bit longer. Do you like the guest appearances? Is it like first day of school over and over and over? Or is the system as far as Hollywood goes so structured that it's just you're, you're switching rooms, but you're not necessarily the new student? Well, A, that's not necessarily true. I mean, I've had a bunch of series, mm -hmm. um, and I've recurred on countless series. I have done. I've chosen because they were, I would say, maybe two or three I did for the money. But um, the majority of the ones I've chosen to do because they were interesting to me. Wow. Like, give so, us an example. Like, what was something that might be unexpected that was interesting to you that may not have been the great success, but for you was personally interesting? I did an episode of Major Crimes okay. that I liked very, very much. Um, and what was interesting about that is that the writing was really, really powerful. And it was about a woman who lost her child to, oh gosh, uh, like a hit and run. Oh, wow. And she searches and finds the person who killed her child. And the penultimate scene at the end is just was just really really powerful and i knew how to do it and i knew i wanted to do it and i remember when when we shot it and i remember what i saw aired and i remember calling the director and saying what happened and he said they wouldn't air it and i said what do you mean they wouldn't air it they said that they wouldn't air my cut because the cut that he did was while they wrote it they didn't think that anybody could handle seeing it because it was so raw and it was so guttural. And so I remember, like, that's when I pick a show to do, when there's something really powerful in it. That's or amazing. there's just people I want to work with. Like, I, 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 you know, Sons of Anarchy was supposed to be a much larger role. It was supposed to be a recurring role. And it turned into a nothing role. But I wanted to work with Charlie and Katie Seagal and uh, uh, Courtney Love. 
So it's like, okay, I just want to go spend some time with them. So there's different reasons why I take different gigs. No, that's amazing because, I mean, we always – as an outsider living in Minnesota, you know, you always assume certain things. It's about the money or this and that. And I think it's great for people to hear that it's that you're almost a fan like everyone else. It's it's about good yeah. writing. It's about working with people that you you've, you've heard about or respect or are talented that you want to kind of be able to to get in there with that talent and see what comes out of it. And so I think that's great for people to hear is because you wonder, you know, is it the money? Is it this or that or and to make choices like you've been able to, it sounds like a lot of your roles have been based on choices, not just desperation that I think some people would assume, you know, an actor is always trying to get that role and I'll take whatever. But it sounds like for you, it's really been the writing. It's been, you know, what kind of mark you can leave on it for yourself going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are some times that you have to take a job because you need to pay tuition. Sure. Or you 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 know you need to keep the you know you need to keep the lights on, um, and so you do that. You take those roles and you have to do that. But when the time comes when you can choose and when you can say, oh well, God, I read that and that looks really interesting. I actually want to put my hat in the ring for that. No, I actually want to fight for that role. Is there a role that you have? Because now we're seeing a bunch of resurgence of bringing shows back or bringing characters back on shows. Is there a character that you've played years ago that you were like? you know what, we only got to see them for an episode or two or, you know, how many. I would really like to revisit that years later on, you know, the resurgence of, of something. Um, yeah, I would love to see, um, first of all, I would love to see where Lorna Devon is from another world. Okay. I think that would be very interesting. And also the role that I did, which actually turned into a spinoff for a pilot to be a series on Crossing Jordan when I played the serial killer not to be confused with the serial killer i played on csi yeah you don't want to get your serial killers mixed up no you don't want your serial killers mixed up um but the one that i did um not susan hildred she was on csi i forget the character's name on uh on crossing jordan but it it uh that was fascinating i i would love to i would have loved to see the the prequel the prequel of, of how she became the serial killer that she is. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is there any show that you've done or a film that didn't get the reception that you thought that you really wish fans of yours now, years later, which would go back? I mean, everything's now on Netflix or, or you know, Hulu. Is there something that you wish more people would go back to and just get a second look at to, that you're especially proud of? I think Jericho. I think the life of Jericho was cut short because I think we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think that we were the precursor to the walking deads and fear the walking deads. Okay. I think that if we had given a chance, um, we would have uh, been a huge hit. I think we were a huge hit with the fans, but I would love to revisit that. I would also love to revisit the, uh, we were the first original drama for TNT. It was called Bull. Not to be confused uh, with, with the CBS show, but not con- no, not not to be confused with the CBS show, but uh, that got lost, and I think like the AOL takeover um, of Turner, I believe uh, that was a great show, and that was George Newbern and myself, Malik Yoba, Chris Wheel, Elizabeth Rome, um, that uh, Ian Khan. That was a really great show about six uh, six young, you know, young bucks on Wall Street. I would have loved to have seen, you know, more of that. I would have loved to have told that story a little bit more. A lot of your choices, I mean, you've done a lot of, uh, you're not the weak damsel in distress. Uh, most of your characters are, I mean, even the serial killer is a strong woman, uh, but you've played a lot of strong women. Is that something that's important, especially with the kids, or does it all fall back to writing where you don't care what necessarily the role is as long as the writing is good? I just don't think anybody buys me as a, as a weak wallflower. Hmm. I just don't, I mean, it's not that I couldn't do it. I just don't think. You don't carry yourself that way. I guess I don't, I don't carry myself that way. It's it's just not, it's, it's really not how people perceive me. That doesn't mean that if given the role, I couldn't do it. Of course I could. Um, but even if I were to play somebody uh, with that, with that characteristic or, or, or with that um, type of uh, personality, you would still see the strength. 
because you can't, you really kind of can't bury that. No. So what, what is your drive as far as day-to-day stuff goes? You show up on set. What, you know, is it a job? Is it, how do you approach the day-to-day grind of, of doing a show? I mean, you, you read the script. The script was powerful. What gets you up in the morning excited to do the work after all these years? The work. You know, there are certain there are certain jobs that you really don't need an alarm clock for because you're just so excited to go and tell the story. And the most recent experience was the CBS All Access Why Women Kill. I don't know if you watched that, but that was something that 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 was a gift. That role was a role that I really feel like I was born to play. And I had so much fun. Um, and in that case, the drive was just going to go play with Jennifer Goodwin and Mark Cherry and whoever the director was that particular episode and the great crew. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't ask for a better day. So in those days, you know, in, in that particular uh, situation, there is no drive. It's just, oh, my God, I get I get to go to work today. I have the great fortune to go step on that set and go play Sheila Moscone. Um, and other times the drive is, this is a hard day emotionally. This is going to be a powerful scene. How am I, you know, what, it, what is it going to take to get me there? Normally that's never a problem for me because I pretty much wear my, my guts on my sleeve. Mm-hmm. Um, and then other days it's, you know, you know, what is this huge scene going to look like? And, you know, what, what is the vision going to be? How am I going to tell this person's story? So, you know, the drive is all about telling the story. It's just about which attitude you're going into it with. Sure. Do you have any desire? Because you really haven't done much behind the cameras. And is that something that you're interested in? Or is more the, the creating of the character, the being someone different, is that more enticing to you? No, actually, I just wrote, uh, not just, but I wrote, directed, and starred in a, in a short film in 2017, and now um, it's been seen by some people, and so I'm taking meetings for, for directing, oh. uh, because I realized when I was doing that, that, you know, when you're acting, you only use so much of yourself, but when you're directing, um, you see the whole, you see the whole slice of the pie, you know, the whole pie, whereas when you're acting, you're just, you know, you're just concentrating on your slice. And so I really enjoyed seeing the whole picture. I enjoyed, you know, being with the actors on set. I enjoyed, you know, baking lasagna for everybody. I enjoyed being in, you know, Technicolor. I enjoyed being in the sound department. I enjoyed editing. I enjoyed every single department that I was in to get my short film ready and completed and locked. That, and so that's where I'd like to go. And so from that short, I created a, a series that we're trying to sell right now. And um, that's where I think I would like my, you know, I always say when people ask, what do you want to be? I want to be Regina King. That's who I want to be. Kind of encompassing everything and having your. Yes. Yep. It's basically a mom. I mean, that's kind of the role of the mom, the little bits and pieces. And one day you're driving the kids to soccer and the next day you're, you know, doing this and that. It's a, it's. There's really no difference between a set and a large Italian Thanksgiving. I'm ADing the whole thing anyway. So I know when to put the turkey in, when the green beans in, I know where to sit, you know, to sit my aunt Catherine, my aunt, my da- you know how to sit everybody. Mm-hmm. You know how everybody gets along. You know how to maneuver the conversation. It's, it's really not that different. And how do your family react to, to you being, I mean, do they, I mean, I'm guessing they're not watching a lot of the stuff that your, your kids are watching a lot of the stuff that you do, but there are some things that, would be family friendly. Do they get a kick out of seeing mom on TV? My eldest one doesn't. Uh, my two little ones, they don't care. They're just like, oh, all right. It's just mom. It's just mom. It's just mom's on TV. You know, or when people stop me and they're like, why are you talking to my mom? <laughs> do you get stopped? You don't a lot? know. Do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you enjoy that? Is that it come with? A, sure. Is that a burden or is that a? No, no, it's never a burden for me, and unless. It's uncomfortable and I'm with my kids and sure. like somebody says something that is, you know, like, you know, hey, I saw when you killed that, you know, I don't need to have my kids hear that. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's um, be respectful. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. And, and, and most of the times uh, it, it's been, you know, I can count on, on, you know, a couple of my fingers, you know, situations that were uncomfortable. But most of the time it's not. Well, that's good. 
are you able to watch TV with enjoyment, or has it all been kind of? I mean, you've been on so many different shows, worked with so many different people. Can you still watch something and kind of take yourself out of it and be able to watch it as just a fan of something? Or is it all kind of you've seen how the sausage is made and you really don't want to have a, a, a hot dog? Oh, my God, that's a great question. Um, if it's bad, no, I can't. If the show is bad and I know it's bad and then I'm like, this is awful. And then I and then I have to go. Okay, I would have done this. I would have done this. I would have put the camera here. I would have done. But if it's good, then no, I completely lose myself. So, what would be an example of something recently that you saw that was good? Oh Lord, uh, I love the Queen's Gambit. I love the Duchess. I loved. Uh, um, oh my God. Oh my God. Uh, all good. Uh, feel good. Feel good. Um, I love Firefly Lane. I just binged. There's so much that I've, I, I try, I loved, uh, love life, HBO max, the flight attendant. Yep. I've, I've watched quite a bit. I, I, and then I watched with my kids. We really liked Julie and the holograms. No, Julie and the phantoms. Okay. We, I love dash and Lily. Uh, I watched a little bit of the good fight. I really very much like that. I, I watch a whole bunch of stuff. I just am constantly having something on because I have, I do a lot of laundry is the truth. When you have a lot of kids, it just comes with a lot of laundry. So I do the laundry and then I come into my bedroom and I fold and I just watch shows. And that makes the folding go quicker and more pleasurable. It's a lot of folding. It's a lot of laundry. So every set is different. Every set has their own kind of, politics and everything like that what's been some of your favorite sets not just as, not acting wise but just environments is there more of those or less of those out there are there a couple of examples that you just thought you know what this was a great set of how just everything was run i don't want to hear about the negative stuff but just this was a great example uh, of how to do things yeah um i loved uh i think anything chuck Lorre has to do with is a great set Okay. He's got the best catering. I'll tell you that right. <laughs> the priorities with you, okay? No, it's priorities. Like, you know, like my people know. Like, let's go with the Empire. Empire, some of the best food I've ever had. Um, I, You know, I'm a New York Italian. I like to eat. I'm not one of those girls who, like, picks it salad. So I think for me, um, I love the way Bull was run. Uh, that was years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Jericho. Anything John Turtletow is attached to is going to be brilliant. And you've done several with him. Yes. Anything that Kareem Zrek, uh, who's now at Mar uh, who was at Marvel, um, he's someplace new, is great. Danny Schatz, John Steinberg, who did Blind. Um, anything, again, Chuck Lorre does. Um, uh, Mark Cherry, anything Mark Cherry does. Like, this is what I've learned. A fish stinks from the head down. If mm. you have a stinky fish head, you're going to have a terrible a terrible time. Sure. If you have a fish head that is fabulous and wonderful and inclusive, and creative and collaborative and kind, then you're going to have a wonderful experience. And which fish head in general, without calling any names or anything like that, is more common in the industry these days for a woman? For me, I have had a, I've had a good maybe two handfuls of stinky fish heads where, where I've said, lose my number and I never want to hear from you again. Well, it's not too bad, I guess. No, it's not too bad. But for me and at the age that I am now and where I am in my life, in my career, the, there has to be no stinky fish head for me to go to work. So I do my due diligence. If there's a job, I see who's on it. I ask around to see, is this person a stinky fish head? Because if they are, I really, I have no, I have no interest. And you're at that kind of place in your career where you're able to do those kind of things without kind of feeling that desperation or. No, I, I don't, I don't work from desperate. I'm not desperate. I'm not a desperate woman. I'm not a desperate actress. I'm very well loved. I'm very respected. I, I, I hope, I, I feel that I am. Um, and I just, I would rather do anything else than work with somebody who is going to disrespect me. It's just simply not worth it and i just hold myself in too high of a regard to permit that 
no, it's a, it's a great philosophy, and I think everyone needs to. I mean, it's not just a an acting thing. I think it's just life in general that. You yeah, know, from... yeah, it's life in general, and I and and I think especially during COVID, you know, I've learned that 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 there are really angels that abound, and they do come out to play when you need them. You just have to pay attention, and and I think the rot the 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 rise of the asshole. I think. I think people are less tolerant for it. I really do. I think, I think that the, the past four years in our country and with the whole Me Too movement um, and getting our former president out and welcoming a new era of humanity and, mm. and consideration and compassion, um, I think that's where we're going. And I think that, I, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that is going to be the narrative of Hollywood because I think that, that women no longer have the tolerance for it. You know, the, the casting couch is, come on, you know, come on. I think that's, it's so old. It's, it's, it's like cocaine in the eighties. Aren't we done with that now? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's silly. So I'm, I'm hoping that the, that the, the way of the asshole is, is, is disappearing. Well, just recently, Olivia Wilde had that whole yeah, philosophy yeah. that she had talked about how I, I think yeah. it was no asshole rule or something, that's something right, along because... those lines and. Correct. Because by the way, here's the deal. We're on set more than we're home. So if you're on set, if you got to be with people who are nice, mm -hmm. because if you're on set with assholes, oh my God, it's, it's a life suck. It's awful. And then, and then going back to your question about what drives you, what drives you is to get through the damn day. That's what drives you is to get through the day, not get fired and not quit or kill somebody. Unless you're playing a serial killer. Yes, unless you're playing silk or getting into a fist fight, you know. And I think that's true so with it's, just any job in general, yes, not just that's acting. Exactly. It's, and I, I do exactly. think COVID, in a way, I think COVID has, in just the last four years too, has given us a, a different view of life. Of you know, it's something as simple as wearing a mask. You know, shut up, put the mask on. And I think we're kind of just our frustration level of just people that are idiots are like, really, you, you can't wear a mask, just put it on. Uh, I think there's this kind of this yeah. whole attitude of just, I think people are becoming more in tune to, to seeing what's out there and just saying, you know what, that's not for me. And I don't want to be a part of that. And so, right. I mean, I'm, I'm really hoping that we are turning the corner into acceptance of every, of every human being, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexuality. I just really hope that, that that's behind us. That's so it's so old. It's so ridiculous. It's so be behind us that I'm just hoping that, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be all rainbows and butterflies, but no. I, I, but I think the time has come. The time has come. Yeah, you no, know, I fully agree. I mean, just even looking at my own story, you know, you start realizing how low someone can get and kind of bring yourself up from that. And you just kind of start realizing that they are people that everyone is just people when you kind of reduce it down to, I mean, yeah, you're a Hollywood celebrity, but there's so much more to you that you're not this, you know, in, in untouchable object of greatness. And I think we start realizing everyone else around us, regardless of their race or what they believe in, we're all just kind of here together. And I think COVID kind that's of right. reduced us all to that to, to some degree. Um, that's so be, that's absolutely that's absolutely right we are i mean again we're just it's just one big party so you can choose to sit in the corner and be a jerk or you know join the party join the fun yeah so it'll be interesting post-covid to see how just if attitudes have changed or how we come out of this and hopefully we come out of it for the better but speaking of going mm -hmm. forward uh hbo max you're doing a is it a series Yes, it's a series. It's called Generation. It's coming out March eleventh. Yes, March eleventh on HBO Max, and uh, it's it's about it's you know it's these you know gender fluid, sexually fluid um, uh, you know teenagers, angsty teenagers trying to find themselves through their very oftentimes um, uh, problematic families, and where everybody stands in the family, and what does it represent, and who are they, and what do they represent? And I'm really lucky I get to play the mother of Chase Sweet Wonders, 
Um, she's a remarkable young actress, um, and it's uh, created by Zelda Barnes and her father, Ben Barnes. And Lena Dunham is executive producing, and I'm really proud of it. I'm just proud to be a part of it. Um, it rings close to home for me, and I just love being a part of it. I was going to say, being a mother yourself, you have three children, correct? I do. A role like that kind of scare you, inspire you, make you work harder as a mother? Is it separate? I mean, how do you I, – I can't imagine playing a mom, being a mom, and dealing with – you know, controversial subjects or going, God, this will be my kids in a couple of years or, or whatnot. Is that, does the motherhood drive you in those roles or is it just another role where you're playing a character and you can kind of separate the two? No, I mean, it is close to home for me. Um, uh, I am close to somebody who, who is, uh, you know, uh, trans um, and it's really uh, important for me for people to tell the story properly um, and, uh, if you're going to tell the story, then, you know, you do it right. And the stories need to get out there because there are so many kids out there who are struggling and who don't have supportive families, who don't have supportive relatives and they're alone. And, uh, you know, I want to see the story told with respect and told from the eyes of the kids rather than the eyes of the parents and in judgment. Um, so that's what, and it's a very small role. I, it's a very, very small role, but I didn't care. I just wanted to be a part of something that was telling the story that I understand. And that'll be out uh, March 11th on HBO Max. Yes. So look for that. Yes. My next question is usually my final question, but I wanted to, to lead into something. And I've, I, I try to ask this on every red carpet that I do, every uh, interview that I do. So many times, you know, we, we associate an actor or actresses with their roles. You know, you're Alicia from Blood and Treasure. You're Alicia from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Jay. When you get up in the morning and you go into the bathroom and you look in the mirror and it's just yourself, who do you see when you look in the mirror? I see my father's daughter and my children's mother, my husband's wife, and uh, a woman who just wants to tell a story. Great answer. And the reason I asked that question earlier is because it has a lot to do with the new podcast that you're launching, uh -huh. uh, Bootstrap Bitch, which yes. is like... <laughs> Not very flattering when you think about it, but it seemed to be fitting because I read your, your bio on it and everything like that. What drove you to, to leap into the world of podcasting? Well, like you, during COVID, I was, um, I wanted, you know, I'm a very creative person and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always doing something and I was kind of bored and I was also thinking to myself, there's a lot of people that I know who have been in, who've been riding the highs and all of a sudden something bad happens. And how do they get out of that? How do they rise above? How do they pull themselves up by their bootstraps and move forward in some kind of graceful way? And I had a girlfriend of mine. She was my first episode, Alex Cap, And she had an experience and I was like, wow, you are one bootstrap bitch. And I don't think it's negative at all. I think it's really complimentary. And, I, and it's, I'm proud of that. And I was proud of her for being able to survive a divorce from her husband and take care of her two daughters and get on with it with grace. And so I thought to myself, well, I had the idea. Um, the, you know, and then my, my husband came up with a slogan. And uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the logo and my my our, our our son's dear friend's father is an artist. And so he created it. And um, and my husband said, why don't you just do a podcast? And so my dear friend, Adam Ferrara, who played my husband on Why Women Kill, he is a really successful podcast called Adam Ferrara, 30 Minutes You'll Never Get Back. Mm -hmm. And he helped me put it together. He helped me. He taught me. And so I just started to interview all the people that I know. So. I interviewed Alex Cap. I interviewed Timothy Amundsen, who oh, wow. was at the yeah. end of her career when he had a major stroke. And then I just yesterday interviewed Jennifer Esposito, Ashley Scott. I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of people and everybody has a story and everybody not. I have not met one person for whom life has just been an absolute breeze. Sure. And, you know what I mean? And that's what I'm interested in is like, for instance, why I want to interview you. Your story for me is not only inspirational, but aspirational, because for me, when you had nothing, you gave. If I'm understanding your story correctly, you sold everything you had on eBay 
and went out there and you gave to other people in the similar situation as you. Okay. So that to me is almost biblical. Like you're a, a saint and you were able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and not only get yourself out, but help others in return. I appreciate that sincerely. I, I think I have a di little different approach to that philosophy or what you're thinking, but I appreciate it for. for well, well, what's your, <clears throat> what do you think? Um, I think I, I get the inspirational part. I think when you're in it, it's harder to see it. But I think a lot of what I did was it's easier to find, you know, attitude. You, it's easier. It always, crap always goes downhill. And if you're in a bad mood, you always take it out on the person below you. And I think for me, I needed a way to realize that I wasn't as bad off as other people were. And so I started selling my belongings you know, out of my car. I mean, I still had some belongings in storage and stuff like that. But I, I sold a lot of stuff out of my car as I went around the country. Um, oh. And it, for me, it was more to prove to myself that my life wasn't as bad as other people. And if I could help them. I'm also helping myself. So I think it was a way to kind of kind of almost denial to some extent was it it's really not that bad because look at them. So let me help them and that means it's even less bad than I thought it was for myself. I think so I think but, for me it was kind of a way to diffuse mentally and just kind of break and focus. It's easier to focus on someone else's needs than my own as I tried to struggle with what was going on. Right, but don't you see that by doing that, call it what you will, whether you were diffusing or you were, you know, trying to find the, the, the silver lining in your cloud when it's pouring raining on somebody else. The fact of the matter is you show you you shown your light on another human being. And by doing that, you lifted them at the same time you lifted yourself. So if that's not aspirational, I don't know what is true. I, I and again, it's harder when you you're going through it. Sure, and living your. But that's the point, isn't it? True. I you, mean, you, you know, in hindsight, that's when you see how you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, and that's yeah. that's the story. That's what I'm trying. That's the message I'm trying to get across. So, you know, you may not know it when you're in it, sure. but you sure as hell know it when you're out of it. See, so, you now one of the first shows that I reviewed was Psych, and so I'm well aware of of Timothy's story, and that mm -hmm. to me, I mean everything he went through and he should have died. I mean, just everything that he's gone through and then to get back. I mean, he still has a way to go, but just to get back to where he is now is just, yeah. I mean, to me that my story just pales when it compared to everything he had to go through. And so but to here's him, the deal. Yeah. It's all relative. True. It's all relative. And so listen to it. I mean, the podcast is up on Apple podcasts. His episode is out right now. Um, check and, it out. and I encourage other uh, yeah, people please, to just because it's, it's. Yes, please do. It's an amazing story about us. He was in a, had a stroke in at an airport. I think it was like Tampa, no, in, Tampa, or Orlando. Yeah, in Florida. And, and, it's why you don't go to Florida. And it, it's just an amazing story. Just humanity wise, not just as an actor that had you know a successful yeah. career. It's just a story of yeah. living life and. It, it it becomes so easy when it, my story, his story, just to give up. And I think that's the whole bootstrap bitch approach that, with what you're doing is, is what you do to go forward. It would have been easy to, to start drinking. It would have been easy to give up on, you know, his rehab that he's going through, physical therapy. And I think that bootstrap bitch part is is what you do after you've gone through everything and what's next. And I think that's what separates yeah, a lot of people. The men from the boys. That's right. And my, you know, my dad used to say to me, it's, it's no matter how many times they knock you down, it's how many times you get up. Yeah. And he also told me, but when you get up, they better be far away from you. Because if they're not, you're going to knock them down. So I always think that to myself. It's like, if I, if you knock me down, you better hope I stay down. Oh, Cause if I get up, God help you. Yeah. Oh, it's a good philosophy. I, I remember a couple of years ago and one of the examples I used to give is there was that story of that uh, homeless guy, uh, Ted, I forget his name, but he had that, that the golden voice, the man with the golden voice. Everyone was talking about how great his voice was. I don't remember if you remember that story or not. Was he the guy in the subway? 
No, he was out panhandling somewhere. Someone shot a video and it got all the, um, it went viral. But my, my point of it was, you know, everyone has a story. Everyone can be inspirational. It's just a matter mm-hmm. of taking time to pause, whether it's a homeless person or someone that's gone through a stroke or just in life in general. What helps is taking time to get to know people. You know, Brian Grazer wrote a book about how he tries to get, you know, to meet two interesting people uh, every so often just out of his inner circle. Because it's easy to be in our inner circle and to kind of find people that we associate with actors, actresses, producers, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. And we, we tend to lose sight of what's just outside of our door or outside of our well, circle. Well, that's, yeah, that's why I think, sorry to interrupt you, that plane rides are so interesting because you're seated next to somebody, a stranger. And inevitably, you start talking. And the thing that I've learned, which is what you've just said, is everybody has a story and everybody wants to be heard. And if everybody could just shut up enough to listen to somebody else speak, it's amazing what you'll learn. Yeah, well, no, I, as much as I like promoting my own podcast, which is just getting started, I would highly suggest that uh, people check out Bootstrap Bitch, uh, especially with just. The Timothy story alone is, I'll, I'm going to check it out just because it's it's a fascinating story, and I think it's I think it's good for us to for people to hear those kind of stories and get out there. And uh, I appreciate you coming on again March 11th uh, for Generation, or no Generation, yeah, uh, on yeah. HBO yeah. Max. HBO Max. Yep. So check that out. And again, I I thank you so much for coming on, and I look forward to possibly talking on yours. You're going to. I will reach out to you next week at some point, and we'll set something up. Thank you so much, Greg, for this for this time, and thank you for your really insightful and interesting questions. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate you. your interest in my work. Thank you. That does it for this episode. Thank you for listening to the Staffa Corner.